ourselves in Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, for our Scripture reading. Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, the Song of Zechariah. And his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit, the father of John the Baptist, prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people, and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, and as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, speaking to John the Baptist, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, For you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins. Because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. And the child, speaking of John the Baptist, grew and became strong in spirit, And he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. Our Father, in our day, there is a man that resembles John the Baptist. And this week, you brought him home to you, Billy Graham. And so my prayer is for his family, and my prayer is that in these last days, that we would take the call of that great man and make a beeline to the cross to preach the gospel. Lord, I pray you would give this church a spirit of John the Baptist. Pour out on us a double portion of that spirit. That it would not just be Leslie, but an outpouring such that her testimony would ring in all of our hearts and we would go find the one and leave the 99. In Jesus' name, amen. You may have your seat. We're going to be continuing our study through John's gospel, the gospel according to John. And today, John the Baptist, what a figure of church history. I want you to write this statement down. John the Baptist was a man sent by God to be a witness of the Messiah with a message that would define us, that would deliver us, and direct us. John the Baptist was a man sent by God to be a witness. Would you look with me? John chapter 1 as we continue our study there in verse 6. There was a man sent from God. Stop there if you would. You're probably wondering, how will we get through chapter 1 if you stop in the first seven words? I just want you to underline it in your Bible. It's okay. Look at this text. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. There was a man. I love God's first outreach plan to the world involved a man. Because God uses a man and uses men to reach men, and he uses women to reach women. 
and he uses young people to reach young people just like he used John as a witness to proclaim the truth. It's what God does. It's the plan for man. You see, this plan, as the Father sent me, so I send, oh, we missed it again this week. As the Father sent me, so I send, oh, much better. That's the plan for us. It's the whole plan of John's gospel because the purpose for which he even wrote this book, we learned last week, so that you might believe. It's incredible to me that the God of the universe would involve someone like me to do such eternal work. It's incredible that I, as a disciple, can hear the command of our commander-in-chief saying, go into all the world and preach the gospel. That's exactly who John was. He was a man sent by God. Now, John was given a special privilege to do a special work. Special work? The special work was to be a witness, So special that Jesus would say of this John the Baptist that there was no greater man born among women. He said this because John the Baptist was given a privilege to announce that Jesus was on the way. No wonder there was no greater man born among women. He was given the uh, the opportunity to be the herald of the king of kings. See, Zechariah's song indicates that, well, these were dark days in Israel. There were people that hated them. There were enemies that were against them. In fact, theologians call this time the 430 silent years. There was no revelation from the righteous prophet Malachi all the way to the last prophet, John the Baptist of the Old Testament. There was no revelation. God had not spoken to his people. Surely these were dark times. Yet from the outside, oh, the outside looks so much different. The outside of Israel at this time had such an appearance of spirituality. When you saw Herod's temple, you were amazed. People would come from all around the world and see this temple on Mount Moriah, and they would be overwhelmed with its gold and how ornate it was and how beautiful it was. But yet Jesus defines this time when he speaks to the Pharisees and he says, you're like a whitewashed tomb. You look great on the outside, but inside of you is filled with nothing but dead man's bones. John the Baptist? John the Baptist was raised by a priest. And so John the Baptist would know the intricacies of the issues of the talk of the temple. He would know all the going-ons that were going on as mom and dad would be talking about priest this one and, and, and as they were talking about Levite this one and Sanhedrin this one. He knew everything that was going on in the temple. But John the Baptist's parents, oh, Luke tells us that they were considered righteous before God. They walked blamelessly in all of his ca- uh, commandments and the statutes of the Lord. And so they would raise him. They would raise John the Baptist in the fear of the Lord as a Nazarite. Now, if you know anything about a Nazarite, these were special people in the nation of Israel. They were given special tasks, and so they had to live a special kind of life because they were specially called by God. So John the Baptist's parents, Zacharias and Elizabeth, They would expose the corruption of the temple to John the Baptist, and they would forbid him to go near it, much like a Nazarite could not go near a dead body. John the Baptist's parents, Zechariah and Elizabeth, they would refuse to be intoxicated with the worldliness of the Greco-Roman way, just like the Nazarite could not go near any fermented drink. The famed theologian F.B. Meyer, he says this, John waxed strong because from the earliest dawn of thought, 
He was taught the necessity of refusing things which in themselves might have been permissible, but for him were impossible. And because he was a Nazarite, F.B. Meyer goes on to say, the strength of a man is in proportion to the feelings which he curbs and subdues and not which subdue him. Truly, John the Baptist was becoming a strong man of God. Mom and dad were much older when they gave birth to John the Baptist, like Abraham and Sarah most likely died very early in John the Baptist's life. And so he would leave them and he would go to the wilderness. And it was there that he would study the scriptures. It was there that we read in Luke chapter 1, he would become strong in spirit. He lived off the land. He ate locusts. They kind of taste like celery. I've had them before. No, really. You pick one up off the ground, you put it in your mouth, it's like, wow, this tastes like celery. A little peanut butter would be good. <laughs> it's kind of like a juicy fruit, though. When you bite into it, it kind of squirts a little. <laughs> Just imagine a celery juicy fruit. <laughs> and he would take these little locusts, now that I've lost you, He'd dip them in honey. He lived off the land. He didn't need the ways of the world. It was there that he would study the book of Isaiah. And he would read chapter 12 where the spirit of the Lord would come upon him. It was there that he would read Isaiah chapter 40. A voice cries. In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And as he pondered these scriptures, he discovered his calling. God began to speak to him. You're the voice. You're going to see the Spirit come upon him. And the same way that God used the scriptures to speak to us is the same way that God used the scriptures to speak to John the Baptist. From that point, from this calling of God, John would go into the desert just like Isaiah said, and he would preach this, repent, for the kingdom of God is near. Imagine you see this guy, he's got a beard out to here, he's got honey and locust legs like dripping all over the place, he's got a little camel uniform on, and he looks at you and he goes, repent, I would repent, I would do something. (laughs) For the kingdom of God is near? See, this was an important message. King Herod had died. The Israeli world was all upside down, not knowing who to give the kingdom to because Herod was killing everybody that would succeed him so that they wouldn't succeed him. So the Romans had to take over. Pontius Pilate got more power. And here's what happens. The Israelites needed hope. They needed to know that psalms would be fulfilled, that the king of glory would come in, the Lord strong, mighty in battle. And so his, this message, that the kingdom of God is near, oh, this message would go throughout all of Israel. The caravans that would come through the desert, they would go into Jerusalem, they would communicate about this really strange guy that was preaching that the kingdom of God is near. So droves of people, Droves of people would come out into the Judean wilderness and they would be baptized by John the Baptist. Well, this caught the attention of the Jews in Jerusalem. This caught the attention of the big religious people. This caught the attention of the Sanhedrin, so much so that they send a contingency out to John. But John knew their ways. Remember, John grew up with a priest. And so as they came, John was not ashamed. He looked at them and he said, you brood of vipers. Imagine if I started a sermon like that. Imagine if I said, uh, turn in your Bible to Luke chapter 3, you brood of vipers. John was not ashamed. John was strong in spirit. John was willing to give them the truth that the time of their corruption was over, that the ax was at the base of the tree. People wanted to change. They were being baptized. An ancient, an ancient symbol of a cleansing of the body that represented something that was happening in the soul. People wanted to prepare for the coming king of Israel. 
The ministry of this man, John the Baptist, was so powerful. No wonder Jesus would say that there was no greater man born among women. But in that very statement of Jesus, he would say something else in Matthew chapter 11. Right after he said that, he would say, Yet, whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. That's you and me. You see, this title doesn't just belong to John the Baptist. We in the kingdom of heaven have the same opportunity to receive the title as we proclaim the coming of the king. You see, John the Baptist was just a man. But John the Baptist was sent, like each one of us, to witness the Messiah. Remember what Jesus said, as the Father sent me, so I sent John was a man sent from God, verse 8. But he wasn't the light, but came to bear witness about the light. John the Apostle had to make it very clear that John the Baptist was not the light. Because his ministry was so powerful, he needed to make sure that they knew that John's ministry was over, that John's ministry was done, because several decades later, we still find people following John the Baptist in Acts chapter 19. They'd only heard of John the Baptist. This was 30 years later. John's ministry was so powerful that John the apostle had to let them know that his ministry was over. And his ministry was about the Messiah, not about John. Verse 9. The true light which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. The Messiah. That's our second point. We have the man, John the Baptist, but now we have the Messiah who is the true light. You see, though John the Baptist showed the way of, uh, of light, of darkness in the midst of his time, Jesus shows the way to eternal life for all time. John is letting us know the ministry of Jesus was about to begin. He's in the world. Unfortunately, the world that Jesus created didn't recognize him. I don't know if you know this, but there's a friend of mine who invented something that all of you use, most of you use, a lot every single day of your life. And he goes to this church. He comes here. I know an inventor. (laughs) And he walks in here, and I know who he is, and I know what he's done, and I know that you use it, and none of you know him. Now, if you did, and if I was to reveal what he made, and I was to reveal what, who he is, you guys would pay homage to him. <laughs> He's made your life easy. He's an inventor. He created. The same with Jesus. Jesus was the creator. But when he came into the world, no one knew him because he came as a baby. And so John, what he does through the first 12 chapters of his gospel is he introduces us to the one that they didn't recognize. John does what I would do to show you who this inventor is. He takes the time to pick seven miracles to prove that Jesus is the true light, that Jesus is the creator. You see, he would lead us all the way to John chapter 8, where Jesus will say of himself, I am the light of the world. And this leads each of us to either reject or receive that truth. There's one or two ways. There are not three roads. In verse 11, I want you to see what his own people chose. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, listen again, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right, underline that, to become children of God 
who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Let me explain. There is no in-between ground. There is no in-between way. You either receive Jesus or you reject Jesus. For the Jews, God had given them the law. He'd given them the law to show you can't meet the standard. He gave them the law to show that they needed a Savior. He sent the prophets to tell them they needed a Savior. He gave them a system of a Passover lamb that they would slaughter and see this blood, but yet they did not recognize the Lamb of God on the cross. And God's Spirit, in the same way that he did for the Jews, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's still in the world today, pointing people to the Savior. He's not changed. He's reaching out, making every effort for people to recognize their need for a Savior. And for those who would receive the Savior, to them he gave the right to become children of God. God grants the privilege to be a child of God if we believe in Jesus and receive him as our Savior. Now, I know there's a philosophy out in the world today that we are all children of God. John says that's a lie. The only children of God are those that receive Jesus as their Savior and Lord. John is making it clear that only those who believe. You see, those who reject are the creation of God. They're not the children of God. They're the creation of God. But what I love about Jesus is he offers hope to his creation so that they can become his children by being born again. You guys, this is not difficult to understand. If you don't have a ticket in your hand, you will not get past Homeland Security. You may try, but have you noticed at Homeland Security, at every single security booth, they have a woman, and she will look at you And let me tell you something, you might think you can pass this woman, but she is trained to take you down. (laughs) You will not, I have seen this woman in action. I'll never forget passing through, someone tried to get through without a ticket because they had to get something to someone that was behind the gate, and she just picked them up by the collar and slammed them on the ground. You ain't getting past whoever she is at your TSA, trust me, because you can't get past without a ticket. Now, here's the best part about Jesus. Jesus has an airlines. It's called Heavenly Airways. It's a, it's a one-way ticket from earth straight to the foot of the throne room of God. And here's what he did. He has sent out an email to the world with a free promo code. And all you have to do is put in J-E-S-U-S into your heart, and you get a ticket to fly straight to heaven. Amen? Amen. That's how his creation becomes his Children, John explains how this is all possible. Look what he says here in verse uh, uh, 13. He says, this is not by man, uh, physical way of a man trying to work himself in. This is not a blood. It's by the will of God, not the will of flesh. And what is the will of God? He says in verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we've seen his glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. What I love about Jesus is that he didn't just create the world and leave it to itself. The God who spoke the world into existence, the God who was the Word of God that spoke the word, world into existence, took on humanity. The Bible tells us in Hebrews the reason our God did that was that he could sympathize with our weaknesses. He understands our human plight. But most importantly, the reason he did it for us is to save us. 
That's the glory that John is speaking about. John watched the glory of God. He watched him live a perfect life. He watched him at the foot of the cross die. He went to the tomb and saw that he was resurrected, and he was sitting in the room when Jesus came walking in. This is that John that says, I saw that glory of God. I saw it. He writes down and he says, he came to save us. Jesus came and he, he came to show us how to get the ticket on heavenly airways. He came to teach us this kind of truth. Would you look with me at verse 15? John bore witness about him. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. He was speaking about Jesus. And John was so excited about this Jesus because he was the Jesus, the Messiah, that was full of grace and truth. Full of grace. Full of grace. It's an important topic because Jesus knows our condition. He didn't come in the world to condemn us. He came in the world to provide grace to live when we fall. How many of you need the grace of God? Would you just raise your hand? Can I tell you something? Jesus is full of it. It flows out of him. He's so full of grace, he never runs out. And for every mistake you make, listen to what the Proverbs write, though a righteous man falls down, he can get back up again. Do you know how he can get back up again? Though he falls down seven times, he can get back up again because Jesus is full of grace for you. Now, how many of you have made a mistake before? Raise your hand. Now, put your hand down. How many of you made a mistake today? Raise your hand. Wives are hitting their husbands. Aren't you thankful that John was preaching about the man, the God who is filled with grace? You see, John and John the Baptist knew they needed it. Would you look with me, if you would, would you look with me in verse 16? For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, speaking of Jesus, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. John and John the Baptist knew one thing, we need grace. Grace upon grace. Moses brought the law. Moses showed us that we needed grace. Moses revealed to us we couldn't live up to God's standard. But Jesus came, and Jesus brought grace, and Jesus brought truth. He not only showed us how to, he not only told us how to live, he showed us how to live. And not only did he show us how to live, he died so that when we made a mistake, we can go to God and receive grace. This is the message. This is the message of John. Would you look with me at verse 19? It's his testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? All right, so John the Baptist is making some impact. So much so that he's alarming the Sanhedrin. He's alarming the religious Jews, so the Sanhedrin send a contingency. You see, his message concerned them. You can read it in Luke chapter 3. Not only was he saying, uh, uh, repent for the kingdom of God is near, he's speaking of spiritual awakening. He's preaching the message that pastors around the country are preaching today. He's telling them, you can't simply call yourself a Jew and not act like a Jew. He's telling them, you've got to change from your heart, not just a physical experience of looking at Herod's temple and seeing how beautiful it was. No, what do you look like on the inside? He tells them, you need to share out of your abundance and fight Fight the tendency to be materialistic. He tells them, you got to deal fairly in your business. 
You've got to bring God into every part of your life. Listen, he says to them, be content with your position and where you are in life. John the Baptist is telling them, you need to learn to trust in God. Truly, John the Baptist is making straight the way of the Lord. But what an incredible awakening message for the church. Fight the tendency of materialism. Choose to bring God into your everyday life. Purpose to trust him no matter what you're walking through. This is an awakening message for the church today. And this message, well this message was bringing on a great revival. People were changing, hundreds of people were coming and the religious leaders were getting concerned. You see these leaders, let me tell you about them. They bought their way into the priesthood, much like you might buy shares into a company. This was a way for them to make money. This was a a mafia ring that was going on. And for someone to be preaching on spiritual awakening, well, they had to do something about it. Because that means that their pockets would be affected. So they came out to John and they said, who are you? You've got no background, you've got no heritage, you've got no family. I mean, Zechariah, okay, he had experience with God. I mean, seriously, John the Baptist, who are you and where do you come from? We are Pharisees, we're of the tribe of Levi, we are Benjamites, we've been schooled by Gamaliel, you've been out in the desert. Who are you, John the Baptist? You've got no education. I wanna know who you are. John responds. He confessed. He did not to die, but confessed, I'm not the Christ. And they asked them, what then, are you Elijah? He said, I'm not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. So they said to him, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? You see, this is the message. John was a man sent by God sent by God to be a witness of the Messiah to deliver a message. It's our third point, this message that John has. Oh, John made it very clear up in front. I'm not the Christ. I am not the Christ. And the only reason they wanted to know that if he was the Christ was so that they could execute him. That's all they wanted to know. Because if you say you're the Christ, then that means you're saying you're the Son of God. That means you should die. The only reason they're asking him about Elijah is because Elijah was John the Baptist's role model. Elijah ate honey and locust and wear this camel uniform. And so they go, are you Elijah? Because if he said yes, they would go, you're a lunatic. Nobody should listen to you. Then they said, are you the prophet? It's because their theology was confused. Moses, in Deuteronomy chapter 18, you can look it up later, he said that the prophet would come. What they didn't realize is that Jesus would be the prophet, he would be the priest, and he would be the king. Their theology was confused. But John, oh, this message, this message defined him. Would you look with me and see what he says who do you say, what do you say about yourself? Verse 23, he answers and says, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah has said. You see, this message, he was defined by the word. The message defined him. He was defined by the word. John had read something in Scripture He had read Isaiah chapter 40, and God spoke to him and said, you are that voice. And John took that word, and John applied it to his life. Verse 24, now they had been sent from the Pharisees. So they asked him, then why are you baptizing? If you're neither the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet, John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you don't know, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose handle, sandal I'm not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. The Pharisees, they look at him and go, you got no position. 
You've got no authority. You've got no official position. Why are you doing anything for God? No one's recognized you. No one has asked you to do this. No one has directed you to do this. And John responds and says, you're right. I'm the lowliest of servants. I'm not even fit to tie the sandals of the king, but I'm doing as the servant what I know I'm supposed to do. No one tells me what to do. No one has directed me in what to do. I'm just doing what God has sent me to do. Wow. Does the word define us? And when God speaks to us in his word, do we see ourselves as the lowliest of servant that just does what God is calling us to do? Like John the Baptist, the message defined him. This kind of heart, this kind of heart came from a belief of John. Because you will behave the way that you believe. And this belief, we see in the very next verse, the next day, he saw Jesus coming toward him. And he said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. You see, this message delivered him. The message delivered him. He was delivered by the word, not just defined by the word, but he was delivered by the word, and this gave him a heart to preach with passion that Jesus was the Passover lamb. Now, if you don't know what the Passover lamb is, Back in Exodus chapter 12, when the children of Israel, they were in bondage. They were slaves. And God was going to deliver them, and he told them, take a lamb. Slaughter this lamb. Put the blood on the doorpost. And when the angel of death sees the blood on the doorpost, he will pass over your home, and you will be saved. And when John the Baptist saw Jesus, he proclaimed that's the Lamb of God. I read about him in Isaiah 53, that he would be led like a lamb to the slaughter, that all of the punishment of my sin would be put on him. He is God. He was before me. He's eternal. This is Jesus. He is the Lamb of God. But this message of deliverance was not just for John. This message of deliverance was for the whole world. But what I love about John, he wasn't afraid. John wasn't ashamed. He was convinced and he boldly proclaimed the message of the Messiah because he wanted others to be delivered by the word as well. And let me tell you something. When you've been delivered by the Messiah, you can't but help to boldly tell people that they can be delivered too. Billy Graham did. For 99 years, his great-granddaughter lived with Andre and I for a long time. I texted her and I said, hey, how you doing, Charlie? She texted me back and she said this, Today, Jesus asked everybody to give Billy Graham a standing ovation when he walked into heaven because he was faithful for 99 years to proclaim the gospel. Amen. Don't just applaud. He's your Messiah too. Follow the example of Billy Graham. Follow the example of John the Baptist because this is a message of deliverance. Finally, John was directed by this word. John the Baptist was directed by this word. Would you look with me at verse 31? I myself didn't know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. 
I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove. I saw Isaiah 12 fulfilled. And it remained on him. I, I myself didn't know him, but he who sent me, remember God had sent him, he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I, John the Baptist goes, I've seen and I've borne witness that this is the Son of God. All John the Baptist knew was, I'm supposed to be out here baptizing. I'm the one who is crying out in the wilderness. That's my job. That's my responsibility. He didn't know the whole plan. He didn't even know the person. Now, I know you're thinking to yourself, wait a second, aren't Mary and Elizabeth relatives? How did he not know the person? Because Jesus didn't reveal himself until the age of 30. Now, I wonder, growing up maybe as cousins, when they lost Jesus for three days, and John heard about this, and he heard that Jesus, his cousin, said, well, I was doing my father's business. I wonder if John was going, something's different about him. I wonder when they were playing hide and seek, and everybody wanted to cheat, and Jesus never cheated. I wondered, was John thinking something's different about him? And I'm wondering, when all the cousins and all the brothers were getting in trouble, and Jesus never got in trouble, I'm wondering, when he came on the shore that day to be baptized, did it all click with John and go, I knew it all along. He says, I didn't know him. All I knew was what God told me to do, and I did it. I didn't need to know why. I didn't need to know the plan. All I needed to know was my part. And the message directed John. And if the Messiah is your Messiah, the message will direct you as well. John the Baptist was a man. He was sent by God to witness the Messiah. He was given a message that defined him. He was given a message that delivered him. He was given a message that directed him. You and I are the new John the Baptist. He's coming again, amen? Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Would you pray with me? Father, I am amazed at this figure of history, our history. Oh, Jesus. At Coast Hills, we want this title. That there is no greater person born among women because we want to be a herald of the King. Would you give us the power of your Spirit to find our neighbor? Because we're sent by God. In Jesus' name, amen.